Okay, today we're going to go over the Asaro, uh, or sorry, the Riley abstraction, and we're going to do it over a series of photographs. And the reason this exercise is useful is it's going to teach you how to locate the rhythms on an actual model because now we're using real people as opposed to a sculpture. And it's going to be a little bit more difficult because the plane changes aren't as obvious as they were on the Asaro head. But we're going to use the information that we learned how to locate the, the uh, plane changes using little shadow shapes and hints like that. Um, and that's going to carry us a long way into locating these things on an actual model. So. Um, first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to make uh, this a little bit easier to see. There we go. And now I need to find a um, color that's going to show up pretty clearly here. Um, eh. Okay, yellow will work. That'll show up nice. Um, okay, <clears throat> sorry, I have a little bit of a cold or something, I'm not sure, so bear with me. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put in the cranium. And if you remember back in the first video, that is the first oval that I put in. And I like to find that first on the model um, before I do anything else, before I go any further. And so the top of the head, the top of the skull, is going to be obscured by the hair. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of guess where the top of the skull is going to be. Um, and this is what you need to get in the habit of doing is um, kind of seeing through what you're drawing because when you're drawing you want to draw through things so um, it's important that you start thinking like that um, and not go for like the exact um, contour uh, right away like you're not trying to find the outside shapes right away uh, it's a very inefficient way to draw so you're going for you're, you're thinking three-dimensionally so you want to draw through and I'll get into that when I do some other videos on just you know basic shapes and and thinking in that way um, but so you as you can see um, I've divided the head down the middle and that dividing line isn't um, it's not in the middle of the oval we created but it's in the middle of the face because you're dividing the face in half and now I'm putting in that brow line and like I talked about before you're thinking about it from the corner of the brow across the top of the glabella and so then I'm going to put in the eye line and a mark for the nose. And when I put in the mark for the nose, I, uh, I'm, looking, I'm not looking for the bottom of the nose because I'm going to create that with that little triangle shape later. Um, when I'm just putting in that tick mark, I'm actually looking for the end of the front plane of the nose so where it starts to turn underneath and become the bottom of the nose um, I hope that makes sense to you um, that's what we're looking for is that plane change so then I've created a tick mark for the bottom of the chin and like I've said before I find it very useful to place the ears early on so um, I f have the one ear on the left I can see it and I'm just traversing that line, uh, the angle of it, over to the other side where even though we can't see the ear because it's obscured in shadow, 
um, it's going to be symmetrical so I can kind of estimate where it's going to be on the side that I don't see it by just kind of following the angle um, from from one tick mark that we can see over to the other side and I'm following the same angle that I'm using for the rest of the features of the face <clears throat> And now I'm creating the corner of the brow right there where it starts to cut off of the side of the head. And you're going to notice because the model has her head turned a little bit um, that, you know, the placement is a little different on the right side to the left side. We're seeing more of the side plane of the head on the right side because her head is turned toward us. So now I'm putting in that glabella and I'm, I'm going to shade that in. Well, maybe not shade it, but I'll do a little hatching there. And the reason I'm doing that is because I, I keep doing that in these videos because when we're doing a lot of these overlapping lines, it is easy for an initial thing that we put in early on to get lost in the shuffle and I want you to always remember that that glabella is there and how these other shapes relate to it because it is so important and everything is built around it so now I'm putting in the hairline and you know your hairline is going to vary person to person hers is um, I'm not sure if her hair has fallen down that way in that way um, uh, or if that's the hairline. Sometimes people's hairline is a little off-center and it's going to vary individual to individual. Uh, we obviously can't put that tick mark off-center. We have to find the... Um, we're, we're trying to find, uh, find it on that dividing line. So I'm going to use the turning point from the end of the front of the forehead to where it starts to turn and become the top of the skull. And that's kind of what you're looking for when you think of the hairline. It's not really going to be the hairline on every individual because it's going to vary person to person. And just because somebody's hairline is a little further back, that doesn't mean they're going to have like a gigantic frontalis. So now we're going to put in the frontalis, and what's going to help us find the, the, uh, the width of that is we have those little triangular wedges on the inside corner of the eye socket. And we can't make the bottom of the oval any larger than, than where those end because it can't overlap onto the eye because it's bone. So we have a tick mark for the top of the hairline and we have our eye line and we know the point that we can't go past um, on the inside of the eye socket so that gives us a good idea of what we're going to create in the uh, size of that oval and, and where it should be. And you know if I were zooming way in um, I could get these things very, very accurate because here I'm drawing over a photo. Um, but it's less important and it actually wouldn't benefit you for me to do that because, um, you know, when you're drawing from a model or from a photograph, you're not tracing it, you're not drawing over the top. Um, so you don't want to think of the, <clears throat> excuse me of the uh, Riley abstraction in a way where you think that if things aren't exactly perfect it's not gonna work because it's never going to be as perfect as you could get it by drawing directly over a photograph but that's not what we're trying to do um, this is a training exercise so I mean we're not trying to you know just draw over photographs it's not gonna really help you um, so, you know, you're going to refine these things 
and we're looking for a general placement um, early on. We're trying to get a general uh, approximation of the model's features using these rhythms. So don't worry if they're not exact. That's not really the point. Uh, try to get them as, as close as you can. But keep in mind when you're drawing from an actual model, um, you're not going to have the luxury of tracing. So, um, y you know, it's never going to be that accurate. And if the method didn't work because of that, uh, it would be of no use. But it, it works even though it's not 100% accurate. Um, it, it's a good starting point. It gets you very close and gives you pretty close planes um, that represent the model's features. And as you continue the drawing, you're going to refine them and you're going to get closer and closer to a likeness. But don't get too hung up on feeling like, you know, if you don't get them exactly right, like with the precision of drawing over a photograph, that it's going to fall apart. So now I'm going to put in the, the uh, temple rhythm. And it's that point where, you know, it comes up through that corner of the brow. And it's a point where the, the front of the head starts to turn to the side of the temple. And I'm doing the same thing on the right side as I did on the left. Um, and, you know, like I said before, the model's head is turned. So because of that, we're seeing more of that side plane here on the right side. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, you, you don't want to try to keep these rhythms even um, on, like, don't think two-dimensionally. Don't look at the actual image and try to keep them symmetrical. Try to keep them symmetrical in relation to the center point that you've created on the model. So now I'm connecting that temple. I'm creating the side of the head. And again, that's obscured by the hair. So um, I'm, you know, getting close. Um, I'm just kind of uh, making a guess as to where that would be. And I think on the right side, I, I don't have it wide enough. It's, it probably goes out a little further. But that's okay because we're going to add things like the hair and stuff like that when we draw. And now I'm using that method that I discussed um, in the previous video about going from the side of the eye uh, up against the frontalis with a straight to kind of give you the width of the top plane of the skull. And I'm putting in the um, hairline rhythm there. And as you can see, we're already starting to divide her features up into these planes. And normally, I probably wouldn't do it in this order. Um, as far as, uh, you know, doing the entire top half of the head and then working my way down. Um, I kind of work a little more organically, like I like to jump around. Um, but you know, for the sake of demonstration, let's let's try to work um, in a, in a specific order. So now I'm looking for the the um, rhythm for the nose here and that oval, and um, you can see the end of that shadow shape there. Um, that's going to be the end of that side plane of the nose. And I can see that because the right cheek, even though it's in shadow, has a little bit of light on it. So I'm using that transition from the light to the dark to give me an indicator of where the end of that side plane is right there. And now I'm just coming up and I'm going to connect it down to the opposite side. And like I talked about earlier, I, I've created the little triangle underneath that original tick mark I created for the nose. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, 
that is going to be the bottom plane of the nose. So now I'm going to create the ball of the nose here. And um, the lighting on this model is um, makes it a little difficult to see where the end of that ball of the nose would be. But you can see there's a little highlight um, on the on the ball of the nose. You can see there's a little, if I had the opacity on the, the layer turned down a bit, you could see that more clearly. But uh, there's a little highlight on the ball of the nose. And um, when you start understanding how light works and, and how highlights are placed, um, you'll start noticing these things and they are very useful indicators. Okay, so I had a little cut there. I had to cough. <laughs> and um, so there's that highlight I was talking about right there. And that's going to help us find the ball of the nose. And I'm just going to put that in right right about here about that size and again you can you can um, adjust this later on we're just trying to get um, um, much closer to the um, features of the individual than like a generic head would give you um, and this will do that even if it's not 100% accurate okay so I created the front of the nose as well by going up and connecting that to the glabella and now we're gonna find the abicularis oris and it's gonna be pretty easy to find because we have this indicator here of that shadow shape right there and I mean we already know roughly where it's going to be so we're looking for little indicators so you want to keep the end of your abicularis oris at where the corner of the lips are and then we have that indicator there that shadow shape and then we know from the previous videos that little shadow shape under the lip um, the bottom of that little shadow shape right there is going to be the bottom of the rhythm of the abicularis so now we have two corners of the lips, we have the bottom, we have these little indicators here, um, and we know that the top is going to come up over the ball of the nose, and that's what's going to give us the wings of the nostrils. So now it's just a matter of connecting the dots, because we have all these little clues. So on this model, the abicularis is going to look, you know, something like... Um, like this here and it's going to be somewhere in there like that and now that you have the abicularis it makes it much easier to put the rhythm of the or the um, yeah the the rhythm for the uh, chin here um, we're just going to come up like that and complete that by going to the bottom of the lip from the bottom of the lip to the bottom of the chin and that gives us that little shadow shape under the lip um, an interesting thing I should note about the abicularis is um, if you look at the top lip here you would expect that it would fall in the middle and I actually see people do that quite a bit uh, it's a common mistake um, putting the top lip like you you put the division between the lips right in the center of the abicularis and it's not really where it falls um, if you think about it turning which is how you want to think about it um, think about that as a curve but if you looked at it two-dimensionally um, the top of the lip so here I'm, I'm showing you that it's actually a curve. Um, but two-dimensionally, the 
the top lip actually begins beneath the halfway point of the overall shape of the abicularis oris. And that's important because if you put that too high, you're going to crowd it too close to the, to the nose and you're not going to have room for that philtrum. So just keep that in mind if you're thinking of the abicularis two-dimensionally and you divide it in half, your top lip is usually going to fall below um, the halfway mark. So it's a, it occupies like the, uh, um, the fourth or the, the third fourth. If you were dividing it into four and you were going down, it, it occupies, it's about the 75% mark, I guess it is the best way to put it. And we don't really worry too much about the bottom lip with the Riley method. Um, because you have an indicator with that rhythm of the chin, so you have a placement for the bottom of the bottom lip, and um, you can fill that in later. It's not really something that you need to place right away. You can if you want to, but I don't really worry about it until later. So now we're going to find the laugh line. And on the model, we don't really have any dimples or anything like that. Um, but we know that the laugh line comes up to that, you know, uh, top of the nose. And I'm using the information I have here um, next to the eyes. So you can see kind of where your, your, um, your, uh, the bottom lids of your eyes or that little uh, like that the bags under your eyes where that area kind of starts and you have that line there that's also an indicator of the the laugh line so it comes up on to that line and then around and I really screwed that shape up I'm gonna fix that in a second That's a little better. So that would be the laugh line. I'm going to turn that off for a second. And now we're going to find the rhythm of the cheeks. And you can see there's a little plane change here, that little indentation. So that kind of clues us in um, that the rhythm for the cheeks is going to come right up over there because that's where you have uh, that cheek shape. So we're going to use the oval um, that swings up, you know, underneath the nose and just kind of complete it from one side to the other there to give us our cheek rhythm. And it's important that, you know, I, I mean, I keep finding these little indicators that I haven't really gone over. And you're going to start noticing more and more of them the more drawing you do and the more you use the method. Um, you'll start seeing these little plane changes and indicators that will clue you in as to where things should be and so now I'm just creating that turning point and from the corner of the lip I'm doing that rhythm up to the top of the ear and down and that little shape that it creates um, is going to be very narrow on some people or very wide on others and now we're gonna find the jawline and if you look, uh, you know how I said before, it's going to be, you know, from the bottom of the lip if you take a straight. 
well, that's not really going to apply here because the model's head, this is an exaggerated version of it, but the model's head is slightly tilted. So because of that, the jawline, I'm going to make that a little bolder here. So if you imagine a head off to the side here doing a crappy head, um, and the jawline is here. Well, as your head tilts down, the jawline is going to appear to be higher up in relation to the chin. Um, it, it's going to look higher when the head tilts toward you. So if you imagine a wrapping line, which again is how you want to think because we're thinking three-dimensionally. If you imagine it wrapping in perspective, that line from the bottom lip wrapping in the way that the model's head is tilted will still take you to the jawline. And then I'm just going to connect that. And again, you're seeing much more on the right side than on the left because of the way that the model's head is turned. And if you look at the photograph, it looks like a relatively straight on shot. And one of the things you'll find the more you practice drawing and, and doing these uh, over a photograph, you'll really start to notice where you might have been screwing up your drawings. Um, and so here what I'm doing, I'm refining that socket shape and I'm adding the brow ridge which is very subtle on her but what I mean by that screwing it up is um, oftentimes our eyes because we we register faces when we see people and we imagine them from a front view um, our eyes will fill in information we don't see and it'll try to make things like work uh, in a way we recognize so sometimes you'll look at a model and your eye tells you they're looking right at you it's a straightforward portrait it's it's straight on but then when you actually do the rhythms over the uh, photo you'll see oh in fact that little turn of the head that seems very subtle creates a much different um, layout as far as where the rhythms actually are so you can imagine if you were drawing um, from the model you might look at it and think oh that's straight on you start putting things too symmetrically and then that's why things aren't working right um, so this is a good practice to also get you to notice how drastic even a little tilt or turn of the head can be so this is going to be the end of the first demo and here's what we would end up with if we were, you know, didn't have the photo. This would be a good starting point for creating the portrait. Uh, something like this would be representative of this individual. Okay, so let's do one more.